How many of you were here at the 915 service? Would you holler at me? Amen. What a mighty word the Lord gave us. Amen. The last time I was here was four years and two months ago in January of 2020 at your national conference. I was so thankful to be there even under some pretty chaotic circumstances. And um, I remember I stopped over in Sydney for like an hour before I flew to Canberra and, and I wanted to lift up the window shades, you know, to see the city coming down and it looked as if someone had painted the windows white. And I thought, man, it's a foggy day in Sydney. And then when we landed and they opened the door, it smelled like Outback Steakhouse. Y'all don't even know what that is, do you? They say it's Australian, but it, you don't even have, you know. They're, yeah. And it smelled like a, a barbecue, you know. And then I discovered that there was brush fires all over the nation. Flew to Canberra. Were any of you there at that conference in 2020? And uh, I think it was day two, Brother Harvey, that... Um, in the middle of the night, the smoke alarm started going off at like three in the Why is it always three in the morning that the fire alarms go off? And um, they were go the, this, the smoke detectors were going off in our rooms. And, you know, the thing is called an alarm, right? But then the lady comes over the PA system and says, do not be alarmed. I was like, lady, that thing is saying I need to be alarmed, you know. And she said, we'll get this taken care of. And, and uh, they finally got it deactivated. And Brother Downs called at about maybe 6 a.m. or so. And he said uh, the, the national conference was being postponed indefinitely. And I said, what's the problem? He said, well, open your window shades. And, and you couldn't see out. You know, there was so much smoke in that city. And um, he said, we opened the door to the convention center. And. There was so much smoke. It just began to billow out, you know. And, and uh, he said, we can't even go into the convention center. And so I remember just staying in my room that day, reading the word of the Lord. And, and God gave me a word that day for, for this nation or for this district, for this body of believers. And I had an opportunity to preach that. Um, for the Turning Point Conference that was online. And um, the title of that message was, This is Where the Fire Falls. And I woke up this morning and I, 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 didn't rem I hadn't remembered that, but I was just praying and reading and, Lord, what direction would you have me go today in my sermon? And, and I felt a quickening in my spirit of the Lord to remind you once again that this is where His fire will fall. And is falling and then I was sitting here during the first service this morning and and uh, the Lord quickened me again and and uh, said I want you to talk on the subject the place of Pentecost and brother Caleb Herring got up here and preached a sermon called the place of revelation and I believe that we are in the will of the Lord right now Acts chapter 2 and 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I, I have so many things I want to share and read, but let me read one more passage in Romans 9 and 25. Romans 9 and 25, it says, As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people. And her beloved, which was not beloved. So let me just stop right here. I know you're standing, but, but that day, it was like January 3rd of 2020, the Lord spoke to me and said, uh, Brother Herring, I'm allowing this resistance and opposition to take place in this nation. And at that point, we didn't know March 15th was coming. 
the, the pandemic shut down and all that. But the Lord spoke to me in the hotel room and said, I'm allowing a resistance and opposition to allow those that have not been my people to wake up, to realize that there is a God. He said, I will call them my people which were not my people verse 26 and it shall come to pass look at this that in the place in the place where it was said to them you're not my people somebody say there now say there there not in a different place in the same place that it was told to you you're not worthy he said i will say you're my children in the same place that you were called unworthy, unfit, undeserving to be a child of God, he said, shall they be called the children of the living God. I want to preach to you for just a moment here today. The place of Pentecost. The place. The fire is about to fall in this service but it is not meant just for this building or this service. I can see it in my spirit as the Lord falls like fire in this place. It's going to move throughout this city and this region and this nation. And it's going to circle the globe. But it's going to happen here today. If you believe it, lift up your hands and open your mouth. And one more time, worship the name that's above every name. Come on, open your mouth and lift up the name of Jesus for a moment. Hey! Somebody shout in Jesus' name. You may be seated together. The place of Pentecost. It, 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 isn't it interesting that God cares about details? It's interesting to me that he was as interested in the place as he was interested in the power of his spirit. He had told them in Acts 1, he said, you know, you, you shall receive power. After you receive my spirit. But before he said that, he told them, go to the place. Go to Jerusalem and wait and do not depart that place. I heard Brother Harvey announce Brother Aaron Bounds is coming. And uh, when he mentioned his name, it immediately rung a memory in my mind of being at Wynn's conference a year and a half ago, and I was standing in the altar praying at the Winds Conference of Palm Bay, Florida, and he, Brother Bounds comes off the platform, and he comes right up to me, and he says, Chris, the place matters. It matters. It matters. The place matters. And he asked, are you in the right place? And it seemed almost random, sometimes Prophets are used in that way. It seems random, coincidental even. I feel the Lord has me to tell you today that you're not a coincidence. And you being in this place is not a coincidence. You are not a coincidence. You are a divine appointment of God. God is very detail-oriented. I'm not detail-oriented. I can't spell the word detail at all. I'm not very detail-oriented. I'm thankful for a wife who is. But we often think that God doesn't care about the details when truly what we're saying is we don't want God to deal with my details. God, tell me what to do, but don't tell me how to do it. Uh-oh. God, give me a land flowing with milk and honey, but let me decide where that land is going to be and how I'm going to get there. But God is the deity of the details. The Bible tells us that the very hairs on your head are numbered, not counted, but they are numbered, and that his eye is even on the sparrow. It says in Deuteronomy 16 that you shall rejoice 
in the place. God does care about the details of your life. He said, you shall rejoice in the place which the Lord your God has chosen to place his name there. In Genesis 28, the Bible tells us that Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God. On that January 3rd, I think it was 3rd, maybe the 4th, but when our, the National Conference of Australia was postponed due to the smoke that had entered in the city of Canberra and, and then entered into the hotel and into the convention center, I, I, I sat there in my room. I will be honest with you, I'm a little bit rebellious at times. They said, don't, don't go outside. And the next thing I did was, I got to go outside. <laughs> I got to see this for myself. You ever go to a museum? I'm not a person you want to take to a museum, you know, because the sign says do not touch. And when nobody's looking, I want to touch it. I think I'm being left out. You know, I'm the baby in the family. I live with what we call FOMO, fear of missing out. If it says don't touch it, I think they're leaving me out of something, you know, a mystery that when I touch this, something's going to happen, you know. And, and so I did go outside for a moment that day, and it didn't take but a couple of minutes, and my lungs began to burn. And, and uh, I went back into the hotel room, and I began to pray, and I, I thought, God, this is not a coincidence. I said, God, you, you, you brought me here for the national conference. You brought all these people here together for the national conference, and now it's postponed. And what are you doing, God? And why would you allow this to happen? And I just began to pray. And, and then I opened my Bible in just to be real honest with you, I, I don't usually open to the book of First or Second Chronicles, but that day I was led by the Spirit to, to read Second Chronicles chapter 7. That very day that we were held out of the church, I read the story in Second Chronicles 7 and 1 where it reads, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. It's a very, I have that in bold in my notes because it's very important to understand that the fire was coming down because when we see the fire coming down, we know it's not a natural fire. Natural fire goes up, but supernatural fire comes down. And it says the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Here it is. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. I love this part. And when the children of Israel saw how the fire, they noticed it too. They saw the church was on fire, but, but they, were, they were pleasantly surprised to be revealed that it wasn't a fire going up. It was a fire coming down. And when they noticed that this fire was coming down, down. Look at how they responded. Uh, they saw the glory of the Lord upon the house. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement uh, and worshiped uh, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, his mercy endureth forever. I love this story. I was in my hotel room as I read this story. Right after getting the phone call from Bishop Down saying, we can't go into the church. There's smoke in the church. And when I read this text, I, I got convicted. I, I was stirred in my spirit. I said, God, I, I pray right now that one day, one day, I, I, could, I could be like the Israelite children. That one day... I'm headed to the Cathedral of Pentecost. I'm, I, I'm, headed to, I'm headed to the Pentecostals of Sydney, you know. And, and, and I turn down the street where the building is. And I look and I say, oh, God, the church is on fire. For a brief moment, I'm terrified. The, the church is on fire. But then I take a closer look and I say, wait a second. Look at the direction of the fire. It's coming down. And I would to God uh, that I could have a moment like that where I, I would realize, man, I'm not going to get to sit in my assigned seat, you know. You all have your assigned seat. You know you do. 
and, and, and we're not going to get, man, this amazing choir and worship team that you've spent, God only knows how many hours you've spent in rehearsal. But the fire's coming down. We're, we're not going to get to sing our song we've been practicing. And we're not going to get, Pastor, we're not going to get to preach uh, the sermon we've been preaching, uh, we've been preparing for. Because the fire of God showed up and said, uh, do you mind if I do it my way today? And this is exactly how I was praying in Canberra that day. I, I said, God, is it possible that one day this would really happen? That I could sit outside, outside the building, the temple, and watch your fire just consume it. And God said to me, why would you want to sit out on the sidewalk when your body is my temple? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> why would you I don't know why anybody would want to stay on the outside when there's fire on the inside why would you want to be a spectator when you can be a participator why that's why I can't stay seated through a service. I, I can't keep my arms folded. I can't keep my mouth closed. I got to make a joyful noise unto the Lord because I am the place of Pentecost. You may be seated. Hallelujah. But it continues, the story continues. Man, imagine that, sitting and watching your building consume with the fire of God. And it goes on to say in verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard your prayer. So notice he didn't say, I hear your prayer. You've already prayed the prayer, and I showed up after you stopped praying, and you've been nervous because I didn't show up when you prayed. But I'm here now, and I'm here to let you know I, I have been listening to your prayers. I heard your prayer. Watch what he says. Uh-oh. 2 Chronicles 7 and 12. I don't want them to think I'm lying here. Put it on the screen if you got it. He said, I've heard your prayer. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, he heard you. And I have chosen this place for what? For good music? For good preaching? What? For good church? No, 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 no. I chose this place for me, for my. I chose it for my presence, not your program. I chose it for my spirit, not your schedule. I chose it for my anointing, not your agenda. I chose. Pastor Harvey, that's why we need to get a little bit of ownership in our spirit over this place, over this church. That's why. When's your midweek service? Wednesday? Sometimes? Okay, we connect with on Wednesday. Anytime you come in this house, you ought to come in here declaring God chose this place. That's why we can't have one dead service. We can't have one boring church service. We can't keep playing games. God chose this place. Oh, you're not hearing me right now. I said God chose this place. That's why I'm going to dance. I'm going to run. I'm going to shout. God chose this place. But wait, so he says, I chose this place for myself. Next verse, watch how he takes ownership, not just of the place, but of the purpose. He said, so if I shut up heaven and there, what did he say? If I, you meant the devil, right? No, the devil can't control that. He's not in control of heaven's resources. He said, if I shut up the heavens, that there be no rain. Watch what he said. If I command the locust to devour the land, that means I take your harvest from you. And, by the way, there's no rain, so there's no new harvest. And then he says, if I send pestilence, the Hebrew word there literally translates to a fatal epidemic or pandemic or any kind of manner of disease. He said, if I send it, 
But wait, look at that. I'm not a, I'm not great at grammar, but look at what he says. If I send, if I stop the rain from the heavens, if I send the plague, if I send the pestilence, is that a period right there? That's a semicolon. That means the the sentence continues. Next verse. If my people, which are called. My people, it was preached this morning, you're, you're not the underdog. Does that translate in Australian? You all have underdogs? You're not the underdog. He said, if I can find a people called not by the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but by the name. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear you from heaven. I will forgive your sin. I will heal their land. You ought to jump to your feet right now and clap your hands that you've been called by the name. You are that people. You've got a God that hears, a God that forgives, a God that heals. Somebody say this with me. Say, the place matters. <laughs> He's not going to cast his pearls to swine. The place matters. This is why Paul said to the church in Rome, verse 25 of chapter 9, he, say, he saith in Hosea, I'll call them my people which were not my people, her beloved which was not beloved, and it shall come to pass that in the place... See, if I can get this, I'm going to finish my sermon. But we got to get this verse. you got to get this verse. He said, he said, I will call them my people which were not my people, her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, you don't belong to God. There, somebody shout there. there. Shout there. there. That's the word you got to get right now. He said, there, not here, there. I don't have to wait for you to get cleaned up, for you to go through pastor's 12-step program to a better disciple. Now, we need to do all of that. But he said, I'm not going to wait until you go from there to here. He said, in the same place where the devil's been lying on you, in the same place where the spirit of resistance has been fighting you, in the same place where you have heard suicidal voices, in the same place where you've heard throwing the towel, go ahead and give it up. Go ahead and stop praying. You're full of lust. You're full of pride. You're full of deceit. You're full of addiction. God said in that same place. You see, isn't it crazy? We have this idea in our mind. We think, if I can just get there where Pastor Harvey is. Don't misunderstand me. We, 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 we need a life of righteousness and sanctification and holiness unto God. Of pursuing, the Bible says, of holiness. I'm not talking about that, 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 that we just, we have this place of arrival. No, what I'm saying is, is that the devil's been lying to us, telling us, uh, you are the underdog, uh, you are inadequate, uh, deficient, uh, you are insecure, uh, you are too weak. Uh, and, and we think, and he's kind of right, if I could just get a, a spiritual gym membership and work out and get my muscles big and, and get my spirit right. Maybe when I get way, and it's this ethereal place we can't even define. It's this place somehow, somewhere out in the unknown that we can't even put a target to it, a name to it. And so really, in essence, we never arrive at that place. It's like this bar we put above us. That, okay, I got to reach the bar. And as soon as we get closer, the bar goes higher. 
And God says, in the same place that you were ashamed that you didn't have me as your father in the same place you were a liar and a sinner and deceitful and a has-been and a nobody in the same place I'll show up there and say you're my son you're my daughter you're my chosen vessel there in that place there somebody shout there in the place where it was said to you, you don't belong to God. You have failed. Somebody shout there. No, 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 no. Shout it there. Where the devil said you're an addict. Somebody shout there. Where the devil said you're not a child. Somebody shout there. Ah, where the devil said you're unworthy. Where the devil said you ain't good enough. Where the devil said you ain't called. Where the devil said you ain't chosen. God said, you are, baby. You are. You are. He's the God who called me from my darkness into his marvelous light. Somebody ought to make a joyful noise. Uh, somebody ought to show forth uh, the praises of him who calls you uh, in that place. You may be seated. Clap your hands again while I get a drink of water. So then why did he choose the place that he chose for Pentecost? The upper room in Jerusalem, the place of both resistance, rejection, and revelation. You see, the upper room, somebody say the upper room. This is going to blow your mind. I studied it. The upper room was on the roof of a house. It was upper. I'm going to let that sink in because I'm about to preach it. It was not the basement. It was above, not beneath. The Lord spoke. God says weird stuff to me. He ever say weird stuff to you? When he does, check with your pastor. Make sure it was God. It could have just been one too many Vegemite sandwiches. But it's good for you. That stuff ain't good for you. Say, I lost you right there. That's okay. God said it was the upper, above. You're not down under. <laughs> hey, the Bible says heaven is his throne, and the northern hemisphere, now, and the earth. Is his footstool. The Lord spoke a weird thing to me a little bit ago. He said, tell them the only thing they're down under is under my throne. You're not under sin. You're not down under affliction. You're not down under addiction. You're not. You're under the throne of glory. But you are above and not beneath the head and not the tail. You are more than a conqueror. The upper room. Now y'all's toilet might flow in the wrong direction. But the spirit always flows in the right direction. Come on, somebody. I'm going to preach it. Okay, that was not God. That was me. That was me. My pastor would rebuke me if I heard me say that one. The upper room was on the roof. Watch this. And it was the most desirable place in a house. And it was often given up to favored, favored guests. 
frequent mention is made of them in connection with kings <laughs> who seem to have used them as summer houses because of their cool temperatures. They didn't have air conditioning, but they did have an upper room where the windows would stay open. The room was used often for meditation and prayer. It was set apart for the prophets. Because of its size and airflow, it was a place of meeting. For similar reasons, even dead bodies would be laid out in upper rooms. 1 Kings 17, Elijah was living through a three-year drought. That's where you've been living, Australia. You've been living in a spiritual drought. And God sent Elijah to live alone at the brook Kirith. And, or he was fed by a raven until the brook dried up. And then he was sent to Zarephath. And, and Zarephath, Elijah would live with a Gentile widow who had no food. And claimed that her and her son would eat one last meal before they died. Uh, but God provided a miracle and they were able to eat their fill. And one day the son got sick and died. And the mother was distraught. But Elijah, who had been, the Bible says he had been living in the upper room of her house. He goes downstairs and he picks up that dead son. And he takes that lifeless body to the upper room of that house where he lays and prays over him three times and God sent a wind of resurrection and revived that boy. There had been much prayer in that room. The prophet lived there. There had been consecration, despair and loneliness in that room. But it had become the atmosphere of a miracle. In Acts chapter 20, Paul, and I have so many things, but I'll skip here. In Acts 20, Paul is preaching. You see, let me, let me just, because I'm, I'm not, it's not my first time here, let me just take my liberty right now. If you want a Pentecostal as your preacher and your pastor, you can't put a clock on his ministry. The Bible says in Acts 20 in the KJV, it says, and Paul was long preaching. The NLT says Paul spoke on and on. And they were in the upper room. And Eutychus done fall out the window. They run downstairs and they pray over him and he's brought back to life. And what was the next thing they did? They said, get back to the upper room. I ain't done preaching. And he preached until the sun rose the next morning. And the Bible says in the last verse of that story uh, that when they all went home, the sun was alive and well. And everyone had been very much comforted in that upper room. <laughs> we find in Mark 14 that Jesus was stepping into a new dimension where he was going from ministering his power and miracles to now he was approaching the crucifixion of the cross. He wanted one last moment with his disciples. A last supper as we call it. And the Bible says in Mark 14 and 13. He sent forth two of his disciples and said unto them. Go ye into the city. And there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say to the good man of the house, The master, Jesus saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. Seemed like a great reservation to have. They had the upper room reserved to dine with Jesus. But that place became a place of tragedy. When Jesus looked up and he said, one of you is about to betray me. That place, that upper room was the place where they would share their last moments with a brother who would commit suicide not long after. It was that place where when they had left that room, they walked a half mile. Sorry, I, had, I don't know how many kilograms that is. <laughs> they are 
They were like, that was a crescendo of like getting the joke. <laughs> he said, kilograms, what a fool. <laughs> they walked a half mile. You know where they went? To the Mount of Olives, which was the place of the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you read your Bible, it says that Judas had left to betray Jesus. And you know what their response was? It says, and the rest of them began to sing hymns. How could you start singing a praise song when your brother has gone to betray Jesus? You know why they could sing praise songs? Because they were thankful it wasn't them. And then Jesus stopped the praise service and he turned around and said, hate to burst your bubble, but all of you are about to desert me. Let's march on. Peter says, not me, Lord. I'll die with you. He says, no, you ain't going to die. He says, before the sun rises in the morning, <laughs> before that cock crows, you're going to deny me three times that you even know who I am. Huh. The place, that upper room where Jesus told one of their brothers, you're going to betray me. The place, the Mount of Olives, where he said, and the rest of you are going to desert me. Jesus dies. He pays that price. He's crucified. Judas commits suicide. He takes his own life. Anybody ever heard of the Great Commission? Do you know the place of that commission, where it was spoken? The Mount of Olives. The same place he told them, you're going to desert me. A few weeks later, he said, go deliver the world. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that details matter to Jesus? He said, in the same place I told you, you're going to fail and fumble and you're going to mess up. I'm going to tell you, you're about to turn this world upside down. But this is what he says. Before you can... Fulfill the great commission. You got to go to another place. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. So where did they go? Read Acts chapter 1. The Bible says in Acts 1 and 12, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of a half a mile. Watch this, verse 13. When they arrived, they went to the upper room. The upstairs room, watch this, of the house where they were staying. The same upper room where they had the Last Supper was the same upper room where the wind was about to blow. <laughs> but for weeks that place tormented them because they remembered the face of Judas. I should have tied a rope around us. I should have connected myself to him and said, No! You're not going to throw your soul into a lake of fire. I'm not letting you get away from us. You've made a mistake, but we've all been there. We've all made mistakes. I should have connected myself with my brother until he prayed back through. I have those places in my life. I have friends that I feel like I've, I've allowed to slip through my fingers because I, I cared more about myself and my own safety and salvation than theirs. I have those places, and we all have those places. If I asked you all to close your eyes, uh, and I asked you to use your mind uh, to take you to a place uh, of embarrassment, uh, failure, mistakes, uh, and sin. It would take you 2.3 seconds uh, for your mind to take you to that place. And it's that place that keeps us from his presence. 
We try to pray through that place. We try to justify that place, and yet our mind takes us back to that place. We've got an accuser of the brethren that accuses us day and night before the presence of, the, of God that reminds you of that place where you weren't perfect, that place where you failed, that place where you deserted God, that place where you betrayed Him, that place where you weren't really a Christian, that place where you aren't taking up your cross and following him. Yet Jesus said, go to that place and do not depart. The Bible says they went to that upper room where they were staying. I didn't give them this verse, but you go to the next verse, verse 14. And it says they all met together and were constantly united in prayer. Constantly. You, uh, this, I didn't give them that verse, but I feel to speak on it for a moment. They all went to that place. You see, we all have that place. Not one of us is better than the next. For we all have sinned and come short. Pastor, I feel a prophetic anointing upon me right now. But what is going to take us from that? Uh, what's going to let the wind blow through this place, these places in our lives? It's not when we point our fingers and say, You were close to Judas. Why didn't you say something? Oh, John, you think you're special because you showed back up at the cross, but you ran with the rest of us. No, they were constantly united. And they said, let's put our fingers down and let's lift up our hands and let's be united in prayer. Let's be united. In we're not united in some of our preferences, united in some of our opinions, but we've got a wind that needs to blow, and it's only going to show up if we stay constantly united in prayer. I wish somebody right now would lift your hands. And let a spirit of prayer come upon you. Let a spirit of unity come upon the Pentecostals of Sydney. Let a spirit. Watch this, Pastor Harvey. I'm going to keep reading. It says, they were constantly united in prayer. And here comes Mary, the mother of Jesus. How many mamas do I have in the house right now? Would you go to the room that was full of men that betrayed your son? As a dad, I'd only go there to bust some heads up. You betrayed my baby. And he was perfect. All he ever did was feed and provide and teach and guide. You betrayed him. But they stay constantly united in prayer. And here comes mama. Mary, watch this. Here comes Mary. And then here come several other women. And the brothers of Jesus. And during this time when about 120 believers were together. You want to go beyond Sydney? You want to be go beyond the Pentecostals of Sydney? You want to go into the highways in the byways and the hedges? We got to stay constantly united in prayer. When you get a red hot prayer meeting going, watch out. Here comes 120 believers. Here comes the people. When you get an atmosphere where the wind can blow. Here's the result of their constant uni unity in prayer. Are you ready? You've never heard these verses. So pay close attention. You ready? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now pay attention. They were all with one accord. And in one. They don't have it on the. They don't know I'm preaching the Bible. Put it on the screen. They got to see this is Bible. They were in one mind and one place. And suddenly 
Here comes the wind. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Pastor Harvey, this is where you're coming to right now. It's not going to get two or three anymore. It's going to fill all the house. I'm telling you, if they don't want the Holy Ghost, they better not step into the house. Because if they step in the house, I said if they step in the place, if they step in the place where God has turned my tragedy into triumph, it filled all the house where they were sitting, uh, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire. Somebody shout, here comes the fire. Now, uh, you said that too weak for me. Uh, shout, here comes the fire. Uh, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire. It sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave. And because they were willing to stay in that place, here comes... 3,000 people. What meaneth this? You must be drunk. No, no, no. <laughs> this is that uh, spoken by the prophet Joel uh, that in the last days, saith God, uh, I will pour uh, out my spirit uh, upon all flesh. Uh, your sons and daughters will... I wish I had a mama that would jump to your feet uh, and claim that prophecy. Uh, my son will prophesy. Uh, my, I wish there was a daddy in the house uh, that would jump to your feet uh, and declare, uh, my baby will come back. Uh, my son, uh, my daughter uh, shall prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Uh, young men will see visions. Uh, my mama and daddy are going to be saved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your name? I remember you. I turned around when we were worshiping just to kind of get a look out here. When I saw you, I remembered you instantly. I remember the last time I was preaching in this church. You didn't look like you look now. Something got a hold of you. You, you were in a place of despair. I don't know your details, uh, but I could see it. Uh, I remember you were standing right up here several years ago, and you were in a bad place. Uh, ha, but God said, you are my daughter, uh, and look at me now, baby. Uh, look at me now. Uh, I said, look, I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, I've been baptized uh, by the blood. Uh, I wish there was something. Is there anybody else uh, that has a testimony uh, that says rejoice not against me, uh, oh, my enemy? Uh, for when I fall, uh, I shall arise. Uh, and when I sit in darkness, uh, the Lord uh, shall be a light uh, in the place. Forty-eight minutes. I hope I'm not too long. But let me tell y'all something real fast. My wife and I, we planted a church on the southwest side of Austin a year and a half ago. And I told Pastor Harvey last night, I said, I used to be foolish. I used to come to your church and your church and Pastor Meyer's church where they've been planting, 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 investing, 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 teaching, 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 teaching. Sowing all the seeds, and now the, 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 the tree has come to life, and there's fruit hanging out here on the branches, and there's grapes on the vine, and I'd show up, and in five minutes, pluck all y'all's fruit and take all the credit. Man, I did a good work here. And, and you know, he spoke a good word. He said, well, there was a purpose, you know, to the voice of the evangelist, and we got to have that voice. But I was used to coming to places like this, and... 
seeing people get the Holy Ghost all the time. <laughs> we go and we start a work, and we started it with 10 elders, amazing people. Average age, 73, these 10 people. And, and I was a little worried at first, but I realized they have, those elders have become pillars in our church. And, and about seven or eight months into this church plant, we hadn't seen one person receive the Holy Ghost. And I'm used to seeing it every week at your church and other churches, you know. Crusades where we go to Bangladesh and, and Malawi and, and other places and we see thousands of people filled with the Holy And then I'm here in this city. And in seven or eight months, I can't get one person to even say amen. And on top of that, when I say, I, I'm not exaggerating, all hell was breaking loose. Devil was upset. I feel the Holy Ghost. Because he thought that was his place. I told Pastor Harvey real briefly, I said, the Lord spoke to me, and I say this humbly. I'm, I'm, I'm not an apostle, and I'm not, I'm not any of those things, whatever, but... The Lord spoke to me and said, you got to understand your assignment. He said, your assignment here is to do the work of an apostle. I mean, instantly I felt that insecurity of Moses. God, what are you talking about? What am I going to do? All I know is, I know I, I had to get up and scream at everybody in the pulpit, you know. and <laughs> Do the work. What is the work of an apostle? And I studied this for some time. And in essence, the work of an apostle. I, I got I got some, some apostolic people here right now, and this is your assignment in this city, in this place, is to take new territory that Satan thought belonged to him. You see, Satan thought that neighborhood was his. Yeah, I, I've been running this neighborhood with addiction and perversion. And you see, we 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 walked on the boardwalk last night. It was kind of a mistake, I guess. We we forgot about the the, the, the chaos going on down there and in the festival, whatever it's called. And we walked down that boardwalk, and and at first it was it was almost comical. And I'm thinking, oh, what are we doing? Why did we choose to walk down the boardwalk? And I mean, I, no joke, it was a rated X film, you know, walking down the boardwalk, nudity everywhere, and I, me and brother. Sharp or just walking like this, zippity doo da, zippity a. I will lift my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. We almost walked right off into the harbor. We were walking like this, I kid you not. I'm not even joking, but I'm gonna tell you something. It was a few moments of walking like that and us just trying to keep our salvation, and then and then I got. I got convicted. I got afflicted in my spirit. Because here I am. I'm thinking, I got to keep, this is honestly what I'm thinking. I got to keep my mind pure. And, and of course, we got to do that. But I got to keep my spirit, you know, away from all this stuff. Because I got to preach to some Pentecostals tomorrow. And the Lord said, that's the problem. You're indifferent to the broken. So you can preach to those that already believe. He said, but your job is to take, take new territory. It says he called us out of darkness. That means he had to go in there and pull us out. He couldn't just stay. He couldn't just stay in his palace of heaven and, and give us a good shout. He had to robe himself in flesh. Carry my sins and say, I will be touched with your infirmities. I will be touched with your addictions. I will be touched with those perversions. I will be touched. I feel the Holy Ghost. And all of hell was breaking loose in our territory of Austin. And I didn't understand it, Brother Elms. I had no idea. I didn't understand it. I was used to going to your territory where you've done all the battle and the fight. And, and now here I am fighting and and, uh, I mean, all hell was breaking loose. I couldn't hardly pray without my phone ringing and a mom say, my son just tried to commit suicide. Uh, someone in our church say, my wife just filed for a divorce and this is happening on and on and on and on it goes. And, 
and then I had people attacking me, and they assumed maybe I'm the problem, you know, and maybe I'm I, I'm the issue, and, and I'm not preaching good enough, and I'm not praying long enough. I'm telling you, I had people literally cussing me out uh, and telling me how selfish I was and a terrible pastor, and, and I let some of those voices get in my mind, and I started thinking, maybe I'm not called to do this, and maybe this is not what I'm supposed to do, and, and I was praying at the altar on a Wednesday morning, and the Lord said, the reason why all of this resistance is upon you is because you're walking into the harvest. He said, it is harvest time. It is harvest. You see, I started to question. Let me tell you all real quick. Where I'm at, there's never been another apostolic work where I'm at in the city of Austin. In that location of Austin, within a 45-minute drive, uh, there's never been another apostolic work. Uh, and so I started to question, uh, Brother Harvey, uh, maybe there's a reason why there's not an apostolic church here. Maybe this is Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and maybe, maybe it's already got the judgment of God, and maybe I came to the wrong place. But the Lord spoke to me that Wednesday morning and said, no, it's harvest time. We hadn't seen anybody get the Holy Ghost. And But I prepared a word of the Lord for that, that Wednesday evening Bible study. At 7 o'clock, church is supposed to start, and, and uh, 6.30 prayer, <laughs> nobody showed up for that. <laughs> we were, hell was breaking loose. <laughs> I was there all day. <laughs> and uh, at 6.30, I noticed nobody was coming, and, and I'll be real honest with you. This is probably too honest. I didn't know if I wanted anybody to come. Because I wasn't really sure. My spirit was willing. But my flesh was weak. I didn't know if I had a word. I didn't know if I... There was no audible voice. There was no angel of God that could really put a confirmation in my spirit. But I had something inside of me that said, this place, this time, this place, this time, this place, this time. So you know what I did? Don't, don't do this. This was, this was out there, okay? I got a Bluetooth speaker. A big one. Red. Bright red, like a Ferrari. I, I went outside on the porch of our little church. And at 635, I started playing apostolic music. I started, I mean, I turned it all the way up. And I started dancing in the parking lot, shouting this phrase over and over. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. At 658... The first car pulls in, and they almost did a U-turn and went back out. They pulled in, and when they saw me going like this in the parking lot, <laughs> it's harvest time. <laughs> it's harvest time. They slowly crept out of their car, and they said, yeah, he, yeah, he's lost it. <laughs> Just like we thought. He, he's, he, yep, yeah, his elevator don't go all the way up anymore. He's lost it. <laughs> And I started shouting, it's harvest time. And I grabbed one, one person after the next as they started coming in. It's harvest time. Even to the couple of people that were, that were not liking me in that moment. They had, they had already told me how selfish I was and how terrible of a pastor I was. But the arms, I grabbed them like, I didn't shake their hand. I grabbed them like this and I said, it's harvest time, baby. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I went into church. I went into church. I said, no worship music today. At that time, all of our worship music was played through a cell phone, you know, a canned music, which is really not a bad deal because they, they never rebel. You know, the canned music is always submitted. And, and so I told the worship team that day, I said, no worship music today. I went straight up to the pulpit at 7.05. <laughs> I walked straight from my little office that's no bigger than a shoebox. I walked right up to the pulpit. After seven or eight months of nobody getting the Holy Ghost, all hell breaking loose in that place. I got in the microphone. There was probably about 17 people there that night. And, and, and the back row is about this close to the pulpit. And I'm in a microphone. Don't need a microphone. But I'm in a microphone and I screamed at the top of my lungs. Does anyone know what time it is? I said it again. And finally, finally, one of our little ladies, she lifted her hand. She said, Pastor, is, is it harvest time? I said, you better believe it. It's harvest time. It's hot. It's harvest time. Pastor Harvey, 
I know this is not a big testimony for this church, but it blew the roof off of our church. In the next four weeks, we saw 12, 12 people filled with the Holy Ghost and this is the place of Pentecost. I said, I got to tarry here until Pentecost. Paul said, there's a wide open door in Ephesus. There is a great work here. This is the place of Pentecost. Uh, 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 this is the place. Uh, We've now seen over 40 people filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and baptized in the only saving name of Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, God, I feel such a prophetic anointing in this place. I see right now in my spirit some of you who for years dread going to work. Dread going to your place. Dread going to your home. You dread going to school. You dread going back to your place of residence with that, with that spouse that has been unruly to you. You dread that place. But I prophesy in this place right now, you're going to have a new walk when you leave this service today. And you know what you're going to start declaring? <laughs> You're going to start declaring over that place. <laughs> This is the place of Pentecost. There will be harvest here. There will be. Uh, because I am the place of Pentecost. 